it's just, just great. I'm so excited to be here in just this wonderful venue and beautiful Calgary and allowing the sunlight, the natural sunlight to come in and uh, sunshine all around. So I'm excited to be here. Ten years ago, I sat in a support group uh, with a young man of 28 years old. Greg was just about two chairs uh, away from me, and it was the start of the day. And he had been through uh, multiple myeloma diagnoses, had gone through uh, bone marrow transplant, so very, very, very high-dose chemotherapy. Uh, and he was telling me his story, and um, he said to the group, he said, uh, I really, uh, I really want to make it to my 30th birthday. And he talked about his life, talked about his wife. And in that moment, uh, I had this incredible feeling of compassion for this young man. Um, and in also at the same, that same moment was like something switched. There was a blur of consciousness. And it was as, as if I wasn't myself any longer. It was just I was sitting in his chair talking to the group. And also I realized that he could actually be in my shoes uh, as well. And, and in that one moment, I had this blinding insight for me, and that is that we're all on this journey of life together. And um, I tell you that at the start of this morning's presentation, uh, because it just isn't the person who has the cancer di diagnosis that we're caring for. We care for each other. We care for ourselves. And although we've kind of subdivided you know, the group into those who've had a cancer experience or their family members, and then the professionals that serve them on the day-to-day, -day, I actually think we're all in the same boat together, and we, that we can learn from each other. And that's really what I'm going to offer you today is the wisdom I've garnered in serving thousands of people in the cancer center and in dozens of weekend support groups. Uh, and so really I want to tell you stories and so that you can recognize, recognize your own wisdom, be reminded of your own wisdom and allow that natural brilliance, that natural light that's there all the time to come out. And so that's really what I'm offering you today. I am excited to be here. I'm excited to present to a group of people who are so proactive in their health, in their health care. And I want to say that you really can make a difference in your health, not just quality of life and an outcome in how you view the world and how you interact in the world. Uh, and so beyond quality of life, you know, by empowering yourself with the information that the blocks uh, have provided here, by practicing, practicing the skills that really make a difference, and by adopting that loving and proactive attitude, you really can make a difference. So, I'm excited to be here, and I just want to honor you for being here, because just by showing up is sending a very powerful message to your body and your spirit about healing and of wholeness. So, in the next 50 minutes or so, I want to provide you with a practical and integrated approach to a cancer diagnosis, an approach that will give you the best chance of recovery and healing, both physically and otherwise. Um, but I want to go beyond that. So I'm going to give you body, mind, and spirit, but I want to go beyond it. I want to go to the next level and address a much bigger question. And the question is about healing and how we can heal at a much deeper level. And so you'll get the body, mind, spirit advice here, but I want to ask a bigger question. The bigger question is, how can you live your life with so much wisdom and love, with so much gratitude and purpose, that healing, natural healing, full healing, true healing, occurs naturally? Or another question is, how can you draw on the highest spiritual principles right down into your life in the day-to-day, -day, and in so doing, transform yourself and facilitate healing at levels of body, mind, and spirit. So this talk is really about the attitude that we bring to the cancer experience. And that our approach, a loving approach, can actually have an influence on the outcome itself. So although I'm going to give you body, mind, spirit, I want to talk about love. Why a loving approach can actually influence the outcome 
and have a profound effect on your life in every sense. At the, at the start of um, weekend retreats, at the start of presentations, I actually want to do something very similar to uh, what Penny did today. Is I actually want to spend a few minutes through a relaxation exercise, through a very simple and safe visualization. And so I'd ask you to join me for that. You can kind of set yourself, set your stuff down, and we're going to actually aspire, aspire to learn, aspire to gain insight there. So place your things down. You can pull yourself off the back of the chair so you're not actually leaning there. Feet flat in the ground. And allow your spine to be nice and straight. It's that feeling of great solidity in your back. Your backbone is strong. And yes, there's a softness in your heart, a softness in your chest. And you have your hands and your knees and your eyes can go down. Your head, top of the head is being drawn towards the sky. So let's just spend a few moments being with the physicality of our humanness, right? Give your mind a break now and allow yourself to focus on the physical aspect of your nature. So you can feel your feet grounded to the floor, to Mother Earth. Your hands on your thighs. the weight of your sitting bones on the chair. Allow yourself to be here just as you are right now. There's nothing to do, there's nowhere to go. You can feel the strength in your back. Relax into your physicalness. Now bring your attention to your breathing. What are the sensations that tell you that you're breathing? You may be able to see your abdomen rise and fall, or the sensations of the air through your upper airways. Very nice. Now imagine that you could breathe in a sense of peace and calm on the in-breath. Drawing in that universal energy, that loving kindness. And now on the out-breath, relax, let that go. Breathing in calm and peace. And out breath, simply release any tension. Now imagine that you could warm up your heart with a sense of love and deep compassion drawing in that energy. If you have to, bring to mind a loved one or the image of a little child, a grandmother, some other point in your life where you have that deep human connection. And imagine that you're warming up your heart like the element on a stove with this loving kindness. And it's growing like the sunlight in the morning. Those golden rays of love are in the middle of your chest are beginning to send rays in every direction. I love myself as I am right now. Now imagine that you could guide or send that loving energy to some aspect of your being. 
Perhaps there's a physical ailment that needs some loving energy. Send that energy there. Or an emotional issue, psychological problem. Send that love towards yourself. May I find healing and peace on my journey. Perhaps a relationship in your life needs healing. Send that love and compassion energy into that relationship. Now think of a loved one in your life that needs healing in some way. Set that aspiration that they may find healing whether at level of body, mind, or spirit, in a way that's just right for them. Just have that aspiration, that wish, whatever's right for them. Send that same degree of compassion out to everybody here in the room and to everybody who's been affected by a cancer diagnosis here or throughout the world. And lastly, from this state of limitless compassion and love, let us send our prayers and our thoughts and our healing to the people who are suffering regardless of where they are in the world right now. Mm, very nice. Okay. You can bring your attention back to the front then. Thank you so much. Whew. Okay, I've calmed down now. <laughs> Lovely audience. Did you scream for them, Elaine? Just the very compassionate souls. So we had a physiological response in something very, very short. That was at three, five minutes maybe. And it also helps us to remember that that's there for us, that we can reframe, that we can tap into our natural compassion all the time. It's there for us, and we can empower ourselves, regardless of the physiological effects and all the things that uh, the Dr. Blocks were talking about this morning in terms of changing your physiology. There's also a physiology of love. There's a physiology of compassion that we can tap into all the time. Um, when I was a medical student, I didn't know what kind of doctor I wanted to be. And I had a life-altering moment, I guess it was. I was in the library, and it was one of those scenarios where the book chooses the reader, and uh, the book kind of falls off the shelf. The book w- was called Love, Medicine, and Miracles by Bernie Siegel. Uh, Bernie was, I guess he still is, uh, a pioneering surgeon, also a pioneer in support groups. And he had uh, something deep within him pushing him on his life's journey, saying that he wants to, uh, to share the wisdom that he garnered on the day-to-day from his patients, how to empower people, how to teach them how to live their lives beyond the medical uh, visits. And uh, Bernie uh, uh, talked about, in this first book, his exceptional cancer patients. He talked about the people who did extremely well, uh, whose tumors shrunk much more quickly than expected, who recovered from their operations or their chemotherapies, who far outreached and outlived their doctor's predictions, you know, spontaneous remission, those ideas. And uh, he noticed that these exceptional patients had certain characteristics. And I'm just going to stop there, because I don't actually break up the world into exceptional and not exceptional. We all have that capacity. And I really think it's the small acts of kindness that we can do on the day-to-day that actually change us as people. We practice that, we live that, we'll believe that. So although I'm talking about the exceptionals and the authorities, it's not an us versus them, it's, it's just an us. It's just us all the time. So Bernie had noticed that uh, these people who did extremely well had certain characteristics So for for one thing, his exceptional patients learned to truly accept their cancer diagnosis. Now, when I'm talking about acceptance, because it's a bit of a tricky topic, 
I'm not talking about resignation. I'm not talking about giving up. I'm not talking about you know, throwing in the towel, letting God take care of all one's issues. Acceptance is more like um, looking at the reality of the circumstance. This is my starting place. This is where I'm at. This is workable. I can, I can maneuver through this. So acceptance was, it's a very, um, it's a tricky topic because there's acceptance and then there's the counter of that that I'm going to introduce in a, in a second. And we're going to talk about the middle road. And I truly didn't understand acceptance till about five years ago when I got a, um, an email from a dear friend of mine. Uh, Karen was a classmate. We were very, very close uh, in medical school. And uh, we had parted paths after medical school. And about four or five years after that, we kind of got each other's email addresses. About once per year, we would email what was happening with the kids uh, type thing, Christmas emails and stuff like that. And, uh, and then I got an email from Karen saying, Rob, can you give me a call? And immediately I thought, somebody in Karen's family has a cancer diagnosis. She wants to talk with a body, mind, spirit guy about, you know, empowering yourself and what you can do to really make a difference on your journey and so on. And so I called Karen's home. It was actually her husband who answered. And the husband said, actually, it's Karen who has the cancer diagnosis. And I was, uh, was shocked. Uh, as I found out, Karen had found a lump in her breast and a lump underneath her armpit. At that point, uh, she had undergone a mastectomy, so had the breast and uh, lymph nodes out. And when I got on the line with her, I was uh, almost in tears, and my, my voice was kind of cracking up. And it was kind of Karen who was kind of reassuring me uh, at that point in time instead of vice versa. And um, I had this full conversation with her, and she was so incredibly um, relaxed. She was so solid. She was so clear about what was happening. I was... I was really shaking my head, and I asked her about that. I mean, how can you be, sound so calm you know, amidst this diagnosis and so on? And uh, she said, yeah, you know, a lot of people have been asking me that same question. I mean, her friends would say to her, Karen, we know you're going to beat this, uh, this cancer diagnosis. And she would say to them, you know, well, that's a really nice thing to say, but do you know what? We don't know what's going to happen in the future. So very much the realist, very much accepting of the truth. She was very proactive in her medical care. She was doing everything else she could do to empower herself. But she had reached this degree of acceptance. And um, uh, I think she had done some inner work either before or very quickly during. And I'm going to read from an email that, uh, uh, that she shared with a, a much larger group because her friends were kind of harassing her. And so she finally had to just say, this is, this is how I'm looking at it. And... Um, and the issue that she's talking about is mortality. This is the elephant that's in the room right now. Because people, for the most part, are scared, scared of their own dying. And so she's able to look at that biggest fear first. Um, and so I'll read from the email that she sent to all her friends. She wrote, But once I managed to accept that, that the reality of my mortality had always been there, I could accept that nothing fundamental in my life had really changed with this diagnosis. I'm still the same me. My life has not changed drastically or dramatically. I'm still here. I was not hit by a bus. My loved ones are still around me. Unbelievably, I can honestly say that I'm as happy now as I was five weeks ago. I am, even in this moment, moment missing a body part or two, hair about to fall out, completely and utterly whole. And she went on to write, and this allows me to see that the last few weeks and the year ahead as the first steps towards rather than a plunge from true wellness. She's in that space. And she goes on uh, in, in, in the email later on. She said, I suffered a couple days of despair after the diagnosis, which is highly unusual in and of itself, actually, because most people are freaked out of their tree for about a month. That's, but she did it in transition in about two days. But since then, I've been, I have known that I'll be okay. Maybe not okay in a way that I would have defined in five weeks ago, but in a bigger sense. I felt that while I cannot be positive that I will beat this, I can be positive that I'll have the courage to face what is ahead. I'm positive that I'll have the support from my loved ones, the expertise from my doctors, 
and ultimately the grace from God to ensure that this turn in the road will not be a negative force in my life. Now, there's always a tension, though, between acceptance that I'm talking about and its opposite, and here it comes. And I believed all that and still believe that from deep within my soul. But in the past two weeks, something else has crept in. I'm starting to believe or want to believe that I will beat this in the conventional sense. I'm starting to demand it of myself and to ask it of God. There's a proportion of women who survive breast cancer of my stage, so why not me? Right? There it is. So there is the tension between acceptance and being comfortable with the reality of the circumstance and yet still being proactive still being loving and caring towards yourself in a way that allows you to get the best care and to do everything else you need to do to maximize your chances, right? So there's the tension that she's living in. There's another paradox that Bernie talked about that sounds a bit strange as well. He said that his exceptional cancer patients no longer viewed recurrence or even death as a failure. They put their energy into the things that they can control and let go of the things they can't control, like the serenity prayer. So what can you control? You can control your attitude, your behaviors, where you put your precious life energy, how you express your compassion in the world, your relationships. And I think that there is actually a physiology of being in that state that actually influences the physical aspects of ourselves. And I think the science is starting to show that as well, obviously. I, I heard it best maybe from one of my uh, young breast cancer patients uh, several years ago. Uh, she was, again, one of these people who on first consultation, I couldn't believe how incredibly calm she was there. She had a young son. She told me she wanted to be cured of her cancer because she wanted to be with him. Um, but essentially, she wasn't scared of dying. And I had, you know, asked that question, are you comfortable talking about your spirituality or religion? We had that bigger conversation. And essentially she went on to say that she says, I don't pray to God to be cured of my cancer. I pray to God to be given the strength to face whatever arises. I pray to God to be given the strength to face whatever arises. Right? Again, this is the same situation. She's putting her energy into the things that she can control, and she lets go of the rest. She gets into this space, that physiology of, of love, of compassion, of being in the world so totally and fully that it energizes her. She brings those higher spiritual principles down into herself there. So again, it sounds like a paradox between those two sides. And the last um, attitude or attribute that I want to talk about in terms of Bernie's exceptional patience is his patients really cared for themselves. So it's the issue of self-love and self-care. And it sounds almost, I know, in this Western society, we kind of get this, you know, that's egocentric, or you shouldn't be doing that, or it's better be doing something else. Well, the fact is you have to take care of yourself first before you can extend out and connect with other people. That's just the truth of the matter. And I saw it best as an image, again, in a support group. A woman st stood up talking about this idea of self-love, self-care. She said, each morning I would visualize that I had a cup in the middle of my chest. And I would pour in the light of loving kindness into my cup. And so she'd visualize this, pouring in light of loving kindness, it would fill up her body. Pouring in more light of loving kindness, it would fill up her psyche and her emotions pour in more light of loving kindness and fill up her spirit. She said, only at that point in time does the cup overfloweth, right? When I take care of myself, then I can extend my energy out to other people and, and really listen and be connected with them as well, right? So those, those were some of the themes that Bernie talked about. Now it's, geez, over 20 years ago. Um, and I can remember uh, reading this book and crying and thinking to myself, I just really, really, really want to be a cancer doctor and I really want to run support groups. And, you know, it is a blessing that I've, I've had that opportunity. Um, actually, uh, so that was late medical school. And before medical school and doing my internship, 
I actually went down to uh, a weekend with Bernie. Uh, so he was running a weekend retreat and then had two days for professionals who were interested in support group stuff uh, as well. And uh, I was a keen little medical student sitting in the front row. Bernie comes in the stage on Friday night, you know, stands behind his microphone there. 180 people, not a little bit, just a little bit bigger than this, this room going backwards. And I'm thinking to myself, what great words of wisdom is Bernie going to offer? Like, how do you teach a group of 180 people, um, you know, about cancer and empowering yourself and so on? So I was just like, ready. And so he walks up to the microphone, kind of very plainly dressed, and he says, Hi, my name is Bernie Siegel. I'd like to start out with each of you telling a bit about yourself and your story. Uh, you, sir, at the back, can you start us out? 180 people stood up in a row and just gave a you know, little blurb about what they were going through, what they were thinking about, person after person, story after story. I can remember a young man who was there. Uh, his mom had ovarian cancer. He was like sobbing, like crying and holding on to her and just really worried about his mom. Another lady had actually gone to the hotel and got a dead chicken, and she had it in her bag. And she actually went grabbed it in her bag and like started spinning this chicken around going, you got to have humor on the cancer journey type thing. But it was, <laughs> it was story after story after story. And I just... And if you've ever been in a, in a support group that's functioned, you know what that feeling's like. There's this amazing energy in the room. It's incredibly, it's like compassion chalk blocked in the air and people listening and really caring. And it was just a wonderful experience. Uh, by the time it got to me in the front row, I was like, I've learned more in two hours here uh, from you all than I've learned in all medical school about cancer and, and what it really means. Um, and then I went back, you know, uh, became a, a radiation specialist and continued to learn and do support groups and, and so on. Uh, and kind of developed, um, and then listened to the science. I mean, really, really great science coming out as well in terms of how we can empower ourselves and how we can change our physiology uh, and how you can tap into both the medical system and everything else. And that's really what I'm trying to endorse for you right now. We're talking about what I call complete cancer care. Getting the best from the medical system, which is actually a whole skill set within itself. Whole, you, you learn that by talking to people, by reading books, by going to support groups, and so on. But it also is a loving perspective. I care about myself, and I'm wise enough to understand that I'm the most important person walking into the cancer center, not the doctor, right? I need to get my questions answers. I need to understand what's happening to me. I need to know what the side effects are, right? So you go with that attitude, and you're smart about it. We also talk about mindfulness, mindfulness of paying attention to what's happening. So for instance, as a quick, and I could give you a half an hour talk just on this topic, but when the doctor starts to use baffle gab, and you're not understanding what's happening, recognize it. I'm feeling flustered. I'm, I can't under, I'm not sure what's happening. And then you, the skill is, say, sorry, doc, uh, I don't quite understand what you said there. Could you go back and just say it more slowly or more easily, right? So you're taking care of yourself at a very practical level. So that's the, that's the practical side of complete cancer care. That's conventional medical system. Now there's everything else. I artificially break this down into body, mind, and spirit, realizing that our humanness is all of that at the same time. Uh, and I do want to kind of highly endorse what Dr. Block and the Dr. Blocks, I should say, are, uh, are endorsing here. You, you gain that knowledge by going to the experts, by reading the books, by looking at the quality of the evidence, but then also listening to yourself, using that mindfulness to find out what works for you. So I'm offering this kind of smorgasbord of ideas, realizing that what resonates is what you need to try need to adapt in your life. So uh, I'm going to talk about body to start out with. Uh, and it's the, it's the motherhood things. I'm coming back next lifetime as a grandmother, I'm sure of it. Because it really, the grandmother stuff is right. So number one thing, the number one thing you can do to empower yourself, to get stronger, is this. Exercise, exercise, exercise. 
right? You change your physiology. You change your chemistry. Beyond taking a pill, if people are depressed, exercise is, changes the physiology of one's, uh, one's brain. So you're actually changing the chemicals there. Uh, you get more energy, you sleep better, your quality of life improves. Just, it is the panacea, and obviously you, I would recommend you get advice about how to do it, but slowly you want to get stronger, stronger and stronger and stronger with time. I, uh, I, went, I gave a talk in Saskatchewan um, a few years ago, and then I went back uh, a year later, and a woman came up to me, and she said, Dr. Ratledge, I don't really remember much from what you said in your talk, except for exercise, exercise, exercise. <laughs> I was happy. She remembered something from my talk. And she uh, began to do dragon boating with the breast uh, group, and uh, she had noticed that uh, a month into her training, her energy was better the day after she would work out. And she also noticed that if she worked out too much, it would kind of drain her energy. So again, you're listening to your body. You're saying, what makes this body feel good? What exercise do I love? How can I connect with other people while I'm exercising? You're using your smarts and you're sending that signal down into your body to say, I want to empower myself. I think that's a good time for a story. Um, okay, here is a remarkable uh, young man uh, talking about empowering yourself. So that's the, that's the balance of the acceptance and the aspiration. We're going to talk about aspiration and how your journey can change, what you can aspire for can change uh, with time. Uh, the title of chapter, Jeff, trading in his hockey stick for a walking stick. So uh, Jeff Eaton actually is the executive director of Young Adult Cancer Canada. It's his cancer journey that I outlined here. Jeff stands six foot five, uh, grew up in St. John's, Newfoundland, um, into a family of professionals, business people, and so on. He's kind of one of these twinkling eye type guys that, you know, is uh, a little bit mischievous, I guess, would be, would be how I'd say to him. And he was quite the, the dynamo. This was third year university. He al already had his own uh, internet marketing company in university. He was going 100 miles an hour and uh, playing hockey throughout his lifetime, uh, coaching hockey. And he noticed that as his hockey game was starting to falter, the guys were blowing past him on the ice and so on. And uh, he was at a buddy's business reception, went to put down a drink, and he fell over, passed out, boom, on the floor. Ambulance comes in, whisks him off to the hospital, He's kind of coming to, they draw some blood. Bad news. Acute myelogenous leukemia. Very bad blood cancer. And uh, scary stuff. Jeff is sent home for six hours, essentially, because he has got to come back in for some big-time chemotherapy. Doesn't know if he'll ever leave the hospital again. And I'll read from here. So twice he went to Signal Hill. Signal Hill's the big mountain overlooking the harbor in St. John's. From these heights, a fierce determination was arising. Jeff wanted to do everything possible to watch these sunsets and to drive his motorcycle to age 95. He choked up at the thought of not having an opportunity to breathe life into his dreams. He asked himself over and over what he needed to do to stay alive. And so he uh, came into uh, the cancer center and... Um, what he decided to do was use his hockey face, his game face, that expressionless uh, face where the eyes were very intense. The feeling that he got as he walked uh, to the arena before a big hockey game, he would get aggressive with his cancer. He created a virtual playoff hockey series in his head, like the standing club playoffs, Jeff versus cancer. Each round of chemotherapy would represent a game in his series. Jeff's family and friends bought into his strategy completely. His dad brought him the official Mario Lemieux stick. A buddy who works for the St. John's Maple Leafs gave him the official puck. And he wore the same jersey he wore when he captained his high school hockey team. The puck soon became the symbol of his soul energy and stayed with him throughout his hospitalization. And every chemotherapy, uh, he would have his like jersey and stick and so on, and the chemo would be here and the lines would be going here, and he'd cross his stick over the lines and then they would drop the puck and that would you know, start his chemotherapy 
strip. And he did that every round. And, uh, um, and he had a good response to his initial uh, chemotherapy. And then he had to go to Toronto uh, for bone marrow transplant. So super high dose chemotherapy. His dad was the donor uh, for that. Uh, and I'll read again. With stick and puck in hand, he began days of chemotherapy. So you give this huge shot of chemotherapy at the start, and then you gotta wait out about 40 days for your blood counts to recover before you're safe to get out into the world uh, again. And so he had a stick and puck with him the whole time. One night, weakened to the point of despair, he slumped over on the toilet. To his left hung his chemotherapy medication dripping in, in from a big brown bag. On his right hung a bag of red blood cells which flowed in smoothly. He began to think about never being able to play hockey again. Suddenly, he felt a presence in the room and a tap on his head. A voice from beyond seemed to say, you're going to have to choose one or the other, the brown bag of chemotherapy or the red bag of blood. At that moment, he resolved to choose the vibrant red blood to choose life. And I mean, he was a bad boy as well. He went to uh, a concert when his counts were super low and uh, did all this stuff. But he, he actually got better. And like, like the minute the doc said to him, your counts are good enough to go home, he was like, to the airline. He's off to the airport two hours later. And, um, and uh, actually, so he had his jersey and his puck and so on, but he didn't, he had to check his hockey stick and he didn't trust the airlines. So he actually sent that one home by, uh, by car. So like United breaks guitars. But a week after Jeff got home, I'll read again, the party came to a crashing stop. At 3 a.m., fevers, chills, and a bad set of shakes signaled an infection in the IV line in his upper chest, back into his hospital for high-dose antibiotics. Jeff was sick, deathly sick. Each day, the frown on his doctor's face deepened. A second infection, plummeting blood counts. Jeff wrote his will and planned his funeral. One organ after the other began to shut down. He became agitated and scared. He was spending what little energy he had thrashing his bo about. And his doctors wanted to put a tube down his throat to paralyze him, right, to try to save his energy. But he wasn't thinking clearly. He began to lash out. His father and brother were pleading with him to let them do it, each holding down a shoulder, a father's nightmare fighting against a dying son. The tube went in, but Jeff was still punching out, exhausted but not willing to let go of the hockey game. Jeff's dad yelled at him, Have you had enough? With the tube finally down his throat, Jeff scrawled a note, not yet. The medication took effect. It required 10 times the normal dosage to put down this raging elephant. Jeff was suspended in deep sleep, barely holding on to life. The next 48 hours were agony for his family. Each hour, the update was worse than the one before. His father arrived at 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning to disastrous news. Jeff's lungs had begun to bleed. Two respiratory therapists focused on his every breath, suctioning out the pink froth. The team was working wildly around him. Jeff was dying. The chance of recovery was less than 1%. Hour after hour, Jeff dangled limp on the brink of death. Nightfall. Darkness everywhere. Waiting. Praying. Clutched in the palm of Jeff's hand was his hockey puck, holding, holding. Even when the nurses adjusted the IVs, they knew not to disturb the puck in his hand. The physiotherapist turned him and stretched him without displacing his puck. Everyone knew that Jeff wanted to keep on playing the series. Suddenly someone asked, where's Jeff's hockey stick? Someone ran to get it. Get it. And miraculously, he got through that. His numbers began to, to go up. He woke up three weeks later, uh, confused, to say the least. Didn't know where he was. He had ICO psychosis. He was scared that he went back to sleep. That would be it for him. And his mom finally lost it at him. Said, you're going to have to take care of yourself here. You're going to have to get some sleep. So he did. He let go. And he... You no, know, miraculously, he, uh, he, got, he got better enough. And actually, he had to advocate for himself to get out of the hospital because he was just sick of being in the hospital for that, that long. 
but he was wasted. Like his muscles had dissolved. His muscles were gone at that point in time. And, uh, and so he began a strength training program at home. Right? So he was at home at this point in time. He was so weak, he couldn't lift up his hand like for a high five. His mom had to brush his teeth for him. It was that type of uh, scenario. And so he had a, actually a training program where he's lying like three quarters up on the bed, and his exercise was to pull himself up to sitting. And that's what he did for a couple days, and then put the bed back a little bit more and pull on. And so it took him three weeks to try to take his first steps um, and on September the 20th, uh, he took five steps and then kind of collapsed onto the couch. But his body was so weak anyways, he just like turned into a puddle on the couch type thing. They had to get him up uh, on his bed anyways. So Jeff made the, uh, the transformation. September 20th is the anniversary of the climb for Young Adult Cancer Canada. Now something interesting, he, so he continued to recover, right? Something interesting was happening. And I want to just kind of before I go in the story, there is a time when you have to say, I'm going to get stronger. You're putting your life energy into getting better. And that was Jeff on his hospital bed at home, focusing his energy, knowing what is right for him. So there is a time for that. There is a time for the strength of the, of the cancer hero. But there was an internal transformation that was happening to him as well. He no longer viewed cancer as an enemy. Quotes, I didn't hate it anymore. I didn't want it dead, just gone. Cancer is my friend. Not a friend I want forever, but it has taught me so many valuable lessons and helped me develop a perspective I would not trade for anything in the world. I began to look at my journey, sorry, my life more as a journey. I would just take one step at a time. Jeff had traded in his hockey stick for a walking stick. And what he was told was if he got out beyond transplant by two years, then his chance of cure was quite high. And on the cusp of that two-year point, unfortunately, his blood count started to go up again, and that was devastating news. His, uh, his uh, chemotherapy had, uh, sorry, his chemotherapy, his leukemia had come back, and therefore the chemotherapy would be coming back too. And then he had to advocate for himself because Toronto had a nursing shortage. He found outpatient bone marrow transplantation in Ottawa, and got the government to pay for it. He went there, got through his transplant remarkably well. Second transplant, not expected to be cured of his cancer, period. Uh, but he also did a lot of his work, thank you. He also did a lot of his work uh, throughout his life, and um, he thought about uh, how he could actually heal at level of the emotions, he had to work with his own anger, uh, being authentic, and he started riding his motorcycle, started hanging out with his best friend's uh, younger sister. Best friend says, don't go there. And he says, but I'd already broken into the fortress to win the princess. Um, and actually a love affair developed and they got married and Karen is a lovely, lovely lady. Now what happened with the original diagnosis was that he, um, he, uh, he had chemotherapy before they did sperm banking and he's really, Jeff is still very frustrated with the system for not for making that first uh, error. And so essentially he's not felt to be sterile, uh, but he kept going to uh, the fertility nurse uh, and having those conversations. And I'll read again. Then one day he dropped off his little plastic cup, called in to chat with his fertility nurse who had told him that he had 0 0.2 million sperm with motility of 10%. Quotes, I was jacked. Holy shit, how did that happen? This is still a super low count, but it's a number other than zero. And while the boys are barely dancing, they're dancing. <laughs> that fall, my wife and I got in to see a fertility doc to begin talking about our options for starting a family. We had a great chat, but the doc reassured us that my sperm count is like using birth control. There was no way we'd have children naturally. What the doc didn't know was that over the course of the last four years, I had begun to love it when the odds were so strongly stacked against me. And then he puts this post up into the, his website. Yes, just after my last super low sperm test, one of my boys beat the odds in a way that I never before. He heard the start gun and gave her, albeit against a much smaller group of competitors than normal, but that doesn't take from, away from the victory at all. So, and um, 
uh, anyways, he goes on to say, yeah, miracles happen. And now it's, I guess, about eight or nine years, nine years after his uh, second bone marrow transplantation, with no evidence of cancer recurrence, Jeff keeps his hockey puck close by. He returns home every day from his groundbreaking work at Young Adult Cancer Canada to his wife and two beautiful daughters. So, yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful story. That the fact is the journey can change as well, right? Um, so body, aspiration, taking care of yourself. Diet is the next one, obviously. Go to the experts, learn it, but listen to your body. Maintain a reasonable weight. Get a good night's sleep in the dark. There's all this kind of motherhood stuff. Ultimately, what I'm trying to say to you is we've been blessed with this wonderful opportunity called life. The fact that you're here listening to me right now means there are millions and millions of things that are going right in your body right now, way more so than could be going wrong. And that we look at our body as sacred, realize that this is the vehicle that allows me to walk out into life, allows me to extend a hand and to give a hug and to receive a hug. So really, this is sacred and we want to take care of it and look at it that way. There's relaxation that we've practiced in the middle here uh, and all the other kind of psychological issues you can, you can work at. And it does take work. It takes time to practice those relaxation techniques. Uh, and, I mean, that's a whole conversation. And then there's the aspect of spirit. So I do want to kind of finish off on another story. But just to say that, uh, again, in the West, we forget about that kind of matrix that holds up life, that there is that kind of animating spirit in our every day, in our every world, and we can tap into that energy to empower ourselves. And as we slow down, we can become much more mindful of the sacredness of, of life itself. But to, uh, um, but to maybe explain that, uh, I'd like to share the story of my grandmother. And... Um, it's a short story, and it's also quite poignant for me as well because the setting in this story is in Vancouver Island in a nursing home uh, where my mother died recently in last November. And that my mom actually had volunteered in the same nursing home where my grandmother was uh, as well. And um, they're both remarkable women. The story of my grandmother, and I'm going to give you a quote as well, the soul force is indestructible, and it goes on gaining power until it transforms everyone it touches. Mohandas Gandhi. On the eve of my grandmother's 110th birthday, and yes, that was 110, I got a call from her nursing home that she was having chest pain. I was worried she was having a heart attack and wouldn't make it to the big celebration that was being organized for the next day. That would be a shame because my grandmother was an amazing woman in many ways. She lived in her own apartment till 107. Actually, she got kicked off the nursing home list at, a, at 100 because she was too well. Sorry, back of the line for you. She composed poetry up until her final months and was an exceptional conversationalist with her many visitors. At 109, she pledged to herself that if she made 110, she'd dance on the tables. Now, unfortunately, her health deteriorated, uh, and so she was more or less wheelchair-bound by 110. I rushed over to the manor to see how sick she was. When I got to her room, I could hear the sounds of a lively violin coming from her room. Three of her great-grandchildren, who are all excellent musicians, were serenading her with songs both lively and poignant. Forgetting about the symptom of chest pain which had brought me there, I sat back and listened. The lyrics of one soft song started with, the birds have flown away. Listening to the beautiful harmony of their young voices, I began to quietly cry, realizing that this would be one of the last memories I'd have of this extraordinary woman. Grandma lay in her bed with a smile as broad as her face. As a doctor, I could tell that her body was very weak and she would not live much longer. But there she was, looking so happy, at peace, and absorbing every moment to the fullest. And more than that, there seemed to be a glow emanating from her that lit the room with warmth and joy. I've experienced that same feeling at the bedside of many people who've released themselves into something so deep and mysterious that their inner light was obvious to everyone. Whenever this has happened, I've walked away from a simple conversation lighter on my feet 
and with a feeling that my heart had been stretched open. My grandmother reminded me that a deep connection to spirit is possible even as the body is fading away and turning to dust. Over my years as a doctor, I've seen many of my patients who were able to let go into a spiritual realm, no longer identifying so closely with their bodies or even their personalities. Something like a pain crisis might dim their light, but once the pain was under control, they could settle their minds, the brilliant light of their spirit could shine through again. I remember one young mother I treated for her initial breast cancer diagnosis, and again after it recurred. She had an exuberance for life regardless of her physical health. We had to delay her initial radiotherapy session because she had torn open her mastectomy sutures during a snowball fight with her kids. So she was pretty spunky. Years later, when she was in the terminal phase of her life, I saw her again when she needed radiotherapy. Walking into her room, I could see that her body was frail, her skin yellow with cancer in the liver. But her face glowed, and her eyes were filled with deep love. Though too weak to get up to greet me, she extended her arms up for a hug. Her voice rang out, Dr. Rutledge, I'm so happy to see you, as I leaned over for a long embrace. She held not a hint of bitterness about her situation, and I walked away from the clinic that afternoon with a lightness in my heart and an aspiration to share my love with others. When we slow down and are mindful of the true beauty of life, we can become aware of the realm of the spirit. It's here all the time, yet so obvious we can overlook it. I am truly grateful to my grandmother and so many of my patients who have lit their way, showing me the light of their living spirit even as their bodies were fading away. P.S. As it turns out, my grandmother's chest pain resolved that night, and at the party the next day, she conspired with two large men to place her wheelchair up onto a large wooden table. She had everyone in the audience sing together songs to her like, I'm tired and I want to go home. All the time, her legs jigged and kicked in rhythm on the table. She got her wish. One minute summary. Well, I guess zero minute summary. Ah, it's summarized like this. So, the people who have done exceptionally well in all the amazing trials, uh, spontaneous remission, looking at their characteristics, they focus their energy on the things that they could do, right? Their passion, their love, their relationships, and let go of the things that they couldn't control. And so, I'll summarize this in one sentence. When your question changes from how can I live to how can I love, then I know that you're on the right track. Thank you so much. You're just a wonderful, wonderful audience. Really appreciate it.